Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Motormouth and Wild Bill Winters. And we are joined here today with Damon Knight. Damon and Bill are yes. going to... I'm glad to have you on together, yeah, fellas. Yeah. Yeah. How's it going? Oh. Good doing? evening, everybody. Good Damon. evening. Yeah. So, all right. Anyway, Scott. I'm having a great night here, Bill. I'll tell you, nothing could be better than uh, coming to the studio and uh, having my Duffy's chicken wings before I got here. <laughs> but that's all right here. Uh, you know, but uh, definitely before curfew. But at any rate, now I... Uh, Glad to have you guys both on. So, Damon, you want to ask Bill a few questions, so go ahead and fire away. Yes. Uh, what do you think about, like, Matthew Stafford uh, with the Lions and, you know, what he's done for us? And do you think we should keep him or not or draft a different quarterback? Or what's your take on it? Oh, Matthew Stafford's your quarterback. He's in the prime of his career. He's 32 years old. You just got to give him a running game. Uh, all the Lions got to do is bolt up front on the defensive line, offensive lines, which I think Patricia's doing. Yeah. And they could, you know, be a sleeper team. Yeah, I, I looked at their uh, their transactions. You know, they, they seem to get a lot of ex-Patriot players, which, you know, that fits the regime because they know what to expect. They know what they want to uh, play or, you know, in packages and what they expect for their players to do and, you know, builds leadership and gets people going in the right direction. You know, you'll get uh, Jimmy Collins, you know, Danny Shelton, Danny Amendola, Trey Flowers, all these big names. And so, you know, it's really good that they bring these people in so that they can direct their players in the right direction. Uh, also, I, um, go ahead. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I agree. It's, it, you can see what Patricia's doing. Uh, he's got three of his former players playing at each level on the defense. Uh, one guy at safety, uh, one guy at linebacker, Collins at, line, uh, at linebacker, uh, Devon, Devon Harmon at safety, and Danny yeah. Shelton at uh, defensive line. Uh, so, you know, defensively, he knows what he's got in those guys. And they're not uh, real old, and they're not real young, they're seasoned pros. But the most yeah. important thing is the salary cap. It fits in the parts of what they're doing. They're just trying to build depth, and yeah. they know what they got in those guys. And, you know, so it's kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, a good system for him. Yes, yeah, and, and with the new playoff format, you know, with the adding of the 14 teams, you know, uh, do you think it's going to be tough on uh, teams to adjust to that with the schedule and, and um, limiting uh, one preseason game? Do you agree with the format? Uh, no, uh, you know, I just think that uh, the, play, the owners are getting greedy. In fact, a lot of the owners didn't want to... Uh, sign a collecting bargain because they actually wanted an eighth, 18th game. It is yeah. what it is. Uh, so this is, I think, another reason why some of these rosters are being re retooled for more depth and maybe uh, getting rid of you know some of their better players. I think didn't Detroit just release their captain and a guy has been there for a long time? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, yeah. you're seeing this. Yeah, you're seeing this a little bit because I think what they're trying to do is spread the wealth out to build a little bit more depth because of their extra game. It's a long season, Damon. Yeah, exactly. It's a long and, season. And I look at it, you know, you're pretty pretty familiar with injuries, I, I bet. You know, and so it's a, it's a toll on somebody's body just to add a game and add preseason games because these people are playing for their life, for their jobs. And, uh, yeah, and I, personally, I don't agree with it just on those basis. Uh, I mean, it also is for ratings and money. It's always about money. But, you know, it's, 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 it's injuries, so... Uh, I hope I hope it doesn't stay like this for long. I hope it's just an experiment and they just go back to the normal way. Um, but what do you think about the XFL? Do you think it's a good place for players to go to to develop? You know, how like in baseball. Oh, for sure. Uh, I've got yeah, for, for sure. The NFL needs uh, what I'm going to call a developmental league. Although Vince McMahon will never admit that that's what yeah. he wants to call his league, but that's really what it is. Yeah. Uh, I've got two kids that I coached in high school. Uh, that have been on, uh, been in the NFL for two years, each guy being on a couple of teams each year, respectively. Uh, they've been activated. Uh, you know, the one was uh, Hines playing linebacker for the Guardians. He was actually activated by yeah. the Browns. And he was with San Diego and Kansas City. So those guys, you know, when they get activated, they get three game checks of 25000 So that makes their season. Trey Williams, the same thing. Trey was on uh, like four teams his first yeah. year, two years ago. And he got activated by the Cowboys. And actually, oh, and Trey didn't even dress. He was just sitting yeah. in the stands because they only dressed 48 and carried it, you know, but they activated 53. 
So that's huge yeah. for these guys. So to answer your question about the XFL, uh, I would say there's about 500 guys playing in the league, and uh, there's probably going to be about 30 or 40 of these guys that are going to wind up uh, making it as backups in the NFL uh, yeah. and not being on developmental rosters because they're getting their reps. Yeah, exactly. And, and you also, if you look at it from like a from a cut perspective, and they cut players that they would like to have, but they can't because of the roster. You know, that's also huge too. Where you know we can keep these guys now; we don't have to cut them or let them go somewhere else. So, yeah, exactly. So I I agree with that. Yeah. And if you look at the yeah, Damon, if you look at the CBA, uh, they're expanding the roster hugely. There's going to be another okay. 130 jobs in the next two years. Yeah. So we're kind of going towards. I you know I, I guess the best way to put this is. We're kind of not, we're getting away from, uh, you know, these superstar players. Uh, I think this is one of the, you know, and, and we're kind of getting back to uh, maybe middle-of-the-road salaries uh, yes. with guys that are proven commodities. You know, they're going to play for 8 or $9 yep. million a year as opposed to 20 Yeah. All right, let me incorporate something here, and I think both of you guys are really on a good path here. You know, I've always been a Matthew Stafford type of person. I love his quick release. I like the different arm angles for which he throws. And he's certainly the best quarterback the Lions have had since Bobby Lane. So, you know, I hope and pray that the Lions stay with him because Matt's certainly been loyal to the organization. Plus, he's a super talented player. He just hasn't had any horses around him at all. And as you alluded to, Bill, okay, you were able to uh, acknowledge that – they certainly need a running attack. So, you know, I think for the Lions to ever consider getting rid of Matthew Stafford, would, I believe would be a huge mistake. Well, of course. Uh, yeah. I, I'll go you one better. Uh, you know, this is, you know, I think it was just the third year for uh, Patricia as coach. Right. Yeah, going into yeah. it. Uh, the third, you know, you got to give these guys a couple years to get their own people in there. Uh, and that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, the reality of it is the draft is huge for them. Uh, you can see, you know, they got Chase Daniel as a backup. He's a proven commodity, yep. but let's face it, you know, he's only going to be in there hopefully for three or four games, and that's going to go all the way. Uh, and they got some uh, really good, uh, you know, depth at offensive line and wide receiver in the draft. Uh, and you can go out and get some good running backs. So, you know, this could be a good year for them where they, you know, wind up surprising people. Instead of going 8-8 eight and eight or, you know, 7-9, and nine, they wind up being 9-7. and seven. If they get on a roll, they could be 10-6. and six. So yep. that division, they're going to knock off everybody. You know, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the person that comes out of the division is 9-7. and seven. Well, let's also not forget that when Matthew Stafford went down, his backups went 0-8 the regular yeah. season. So they were very competitive yeah. uh, with Matthew. So they would have had a halfway decent backup. Perhaps things wouldn't be as bad. So, But that said, I want both your opinions on this, okay? Damon, and then you follow up, okay? I know Tua's out there, and yeah. now the uh, Chargers – uh, you know, since Philip Rivers left, do you think the Lions are still to a territory, or do you think that he's going to uh, be taken by somebody else, whether it's the Dolphins, the Chargers, I believe, sixth? Because I cannot imagine Washington would go ahead and uh, take two of it. I, I've been wrong before. So, Damon, lead off. Uh, yes, I, I, um, I don't think the Lions are to a territory. I think, like what Bill just said about how Matthew Stafford is the guy, and I truly believe that. I don't, I don't want somebody that has an injury history. Well, Matthew Stafford has the back injury, but to well, draft to just be a complete betrayal. Um, but I could see a team jumping to Washington and uh, or jump or trading with Washington to jump and get to a, you know, whether it be the Chargers losing Philip Rivers. I would not be shocked if it was New England if they pulled off a trade to grab to a or to grab whoever they think six fit to replace Brady. You know, uh, I think I would not be shocked if the Lions grabbed Andrew Thomas, offensive tackle from Georgia, or if they draft Chase Young. You know, if if he falls to them somehow. What do you think, Bill? Um, I, I, I I there's no way that I'm drafting to it. Uh, you know, two injury prone, uh, and the second thing is you got your starting quarterback. You got a, you got a proven backup in Chase Daniel. You got to go out and you, and they just got done redoing their roster uh, to getting three players, you know, on defense at each level, defensive line, linebacker, and safety that are proven commodities. That are in a, you know, slotted with good salary caps. You got to do the same thing on the offense. Uh, so you don't want to be going and going out and getting a quarterback. Uh, you know, not when you can go out and find some veteran guys. 
guys like Andy Dalton are floating around, Seamus Winston are floating around, and you don't have to pay through the nose to get those guys because they, if they were going to get paid, uh, they would have gotten, you know, they would have been picked up uh, just like Rivers and all those other guys. So they're going to be playing in the wind. So those guys, if they want to play, are going to be taking pay cuts. And you're going to have, you know, a guy that's got a lot of reps and would be better than Tua. Uh, so that's what I'm doing if I'm the general manager. And I think Patricia comes from New England where they're not going to, you know, they, when they found Brady in the lower rounds, so they think they can, you know, their value, there's value picks out there, a quarterback, where you don't have to, you know, go out and draft a kid number one like Tua. Yeah. Good point. Well, I see a lot of good uh, camaraderie going. So, Bill, we're going to write, write it out a little bit, okay, if you don't mind. Uh, let's talk about the CBA. I know, uh, Damon, uh, hang around. I'm sure you'll have some worthwhile opinions as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, Bill, why don't you go ahead and talk about the CBA? Okay. Um, well, the first thing will be my notes. I was talking to my contacts this morning. Uh, the, the first thing I want to say to you about the collective bargaining agreements is that the owners really wanted their 17th game. Uh, they wanted an extra playoff game. And, uh, you know, in order to get the players to, to sign it, uh, they went after 65% of the guys in the league that are playing for the league minimum, which is 490000 And they dangled significant pay raises. And so you have young kids that represent the majority of the players in your league. Uh, you know, that's why they were able to push it through. Um, and, you know, there, there's an escalator clause in that contract uh, that allows the owners to make another $6 billion if they get this TV deal done. All right, so really what you're looking at is an expansion of rosters from 53 to 55 for 2021, 55 to 57 in 2023. All right, and you're watching salaries go from 490 up to 580. And then you're going to have raises where a guy that's going to be coming into the league uh, probably in three years as a rookie, uh, you know, if they get this um, uh, TV deal done, uh, they're, you know, they're going to start out at a million dollars a year as their minimum salary. So, you know, that's very attractive to a lot of young guys that are coming up. Now, the older players, uh, you know, the J.J. Watts and the Aaron Rodgers, they're kind of looking for, uh, you know, a little better taking care of the players in their 40s, uh, you know, but they're not going to get that because they, they're not the majority. But you can kind of see by the vote that, uh, you know, that the collective bargaining just eked by. Um, the developmental rosters are going to go from 10 to 12, all right, and then 12 to 14 in 2023. All right, so that's another 130 jobs. So, you know, the union feels like they did their job, okay, allowing, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting that for their players. All right, now, the other thing is that um, the last year when the 49ers sat back and uh, were in a buy, they didn't get paid. All right, so one of the big caveats now is the team that's going to sit out with a buy, because there's only going to be one team that's going to have a buy, uh, that's the best, you know, team with the best record in each conference. But this guy's going to get a quarter million piece. That's huge. Mm -hmm. All right? And yeah. then you're also talking about uh, 17 games, which is going to be broken down, eight home games, eight away games, and you're going to have one international game. And what the players are going to get is uh, they get 25000 a game now for going overseas. In 2021, it'll bump up to forty k. All right? So uh, for, for, for a lot of guys, you know, money talks – you know, and that's and, and that's what they're seeing because they want their contracts front loaded because most of the guys are, you know, 65% of the leagues are guys that are first or second year players. All right, and you can kind of see the shift in the dynamic because you're seeing things, players not signing guys like DeAndre Hopkins, Jadavian Clowney, because these guys are asking for, you know, 20, 23 million, all right, because they're, you know, in the top and they're, and they're just not going to get it. Uh, yeah. You know, and uh, the, the players that were going to get it uh, have gotten it and have made their moves. Uh, so there's a little bit of a shift in the dynamic because what I call socialized uh, NFL over the next five or six years because I just don't think you're going to have uh, guys that are going to be making, you know, real, real big money. I think they've learned their lesson. And I think, you know, uh, Tom Brady's going to get paid probably $30 million in those state tax. Yeah. But he's making up for all those years where he kind of slotted the way Detroit's doing it right now with Patricia. And the last yeah. thing I want to say, uh, you know, uh, I don't mean to dominate too much about the conversation. Oh, you're good. I think this is also this is also really subtle to me. Uh, they, they're not going to suspend any players for weed and marijuana. Well, what they are going to do is they're going to fine them and continue to fine them. And then if they and the fines are going to be game checks, half game checks, you know, yada yada yada. So uh, you know that's pretty much it. You know, without going into a lot of great detail, 
I just want to get your guys' thoughts on it. Oh, go ahead, Damon. Personally, uh, to find a player because of like, on a, uh, some music for regulation, you know, to, to ease anxiety, to do whatever it takes to make sure that they're at their best. Uh, to find them, that's kind of harsh. Uh, I can think of worse, worse things. Um, as far as like adding games, uh, to, like I said before, uh, taking the tolls on players. Uh, yeah, it's, it's money. Oh, that's all it is. It's just money to raise for the league and for the players, and you know, uh, we'll see over time. Well, Damon, let me. I'll add, I'll add this. Uh, the owners are, you know, they're the best bean counters on the planet. Yeah. Okay. And when you have, you know, you have a young generation that is, you know, basically doesn't drink, uh, that, yeah. that doesn't do hard narcotics. Uh, yeah. You know, the guys relax smoking weed, and there's, you know, there's a lot of guys that uh, like Mark Stepnowski. He's up in Canada. He's been advocating that the NFL, you know, not find players for smoking weed because I think, you know, you, you just you see that a, a, there's a lot more players doing that uh, just yeah. stay off their feet and relax and stay at home, okay? And they're not self-medicating with marijuana. It's just the way it is. And there's sort of a movement uh, going on over there. But I just wanted to go over it a little bit. The new CBA removes all substance abuse suspensions for positive drug tests. The CBA, no player will be suspended during the next decade for testing positive for marijuana or any other substance of abuse. Yeah. The 2020 substance abuse policy, a link to which is distributed to all players eligible to vote by a mail, removes all suspensions for positive tests. Instead, players will be subject to fines only for a positive drug test. Player in states one of the program who tests positive faces no penalty at all, other than being advanced to stage two. In stage two, Positive tests result only in fines. For the first violation, the player only loses one half of a game check. For the second violation, he loses a week's pay. For the third violation, it's two weeks' salary. For the fourth and all subsequent violations, it's a three-game fine. All right, so we're, all they're really doing is getting into the players' pockets. Yeah. Okay, and I think the players can decide how important that joint is if they smoke or whatever based on, you know, where they are, you know, financially. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I thought that was very interesting rather than being suspended. Because when players got suspended, it was a great way for the owners to recoup their money. Yeah, yeah, it's, insurance, it's an insurance policy. It's just, you know, make, making sure that these players are following rules. I get it. Yeah, it's, it's a good structure thing to do for players. Um, well, let me jump I, in. I, let me jump in yeah. about the international game, Bill. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, yeah. what. This inter this extra game allows uh, the teams like the Green Bay Packers, who would never give up a home game, to go over there, you know. And I think it's definitely uh, great for the business model when you can see teams like the Green Bay Packers or other organizations that are reluctant to go over there because they obviously it doesn't pay for them to do it, you know. I mean, in recent years. The Rams have gone over there because they've been playing in the Coliseum. Oakland's been more than willing to do it. And, of course, the Chargers. But now when you have a chance to open up the international market for teams like the Packers and some of the other hot beds out there, then I think there's no question it can definitely benefit. And of course, another fifteen grand in your pocket doesn't hurt either from the 25000 Or the Jacksonville Jaguars depend on those international games just to stay above water. So... Good point. That I'm glad Scott, you brought. There's three things driving this CBA. What's that? No. The new salary schedule, mm -hmm. the overseas bonuses, and the TV deal. Right. Okay, and that's the three things that are the components to this CBA, and why the players ratified it. They like to bump up and pay. You know, you're really looking at going from 490 to an average of 710 thousand dollars. That's huge for a rookie who's 21, 22 years old who may not be a high round draft choice. Uh, the owners, uh, they love the overseas bonus. And, you know, the thing is now everybody has a competitive a disadvantage because everyone has to play a foreign game because now you have a 17th game. Uh, it's not like, you know, one, one team's going to London and another team isn't. Because going overseas really, really, it gasses a lot of teams. Uh, it's really tough to recover, you know, particularly when you're flying to London and playing at 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, that kind of thing. So, and then, you know, of course, the TV deal, uh, that's huge. Uh, you're talking an extra $6 billion coming to the owners, and they're going to kick that back to the players, uh, probably kick back about a billion dollars for them. 
So over the next couple of years, you're going to see a, a quantum leap in player salaries uh, for most of the guys that are, you know, uh, the majority of the league. I, w- I would find it hard to believe that the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, during a 16-game schedule, would ever go ahead and give up a home game. But it doesn't mean that they won't go as a visitor. But Because, again, you're talking about a, a football hotbed out in Kansas City, as I mentioned about the Green Bay Packers, and I'm sure there's other ones that I probably am not talking about. I don't think the Lions would even give up a home game to go overseas as well because as bad as they are, you know, football is uh, – is a, uh, you know, pro football is huge back home in Metro Detroit. So, but, you know, but, but now, hey, Scott, what's that? No, no doubt. That's why it's 17 games. Eight oh, yeah. home, eight away, and one international game. So that's it solved. Yeah, I, I'm, gl- I'm glad that they were able to get it done. Damon, continue to ask Bill some questions. It's one of your rare opportunities to talk to our uh, NFL analyst. Yeah, so uh, what's it like playing the NFL? Like, what, um, like, what do you, what's your, like being a rock star. Or just, what's up? Uh, well, you know, football, uh, football players are very routine guys. Very, uh, you know, superstitious. That's why a lot of the guys hate playing on Thursdays. All right, you know, you, you get into a routine where you're playing on Sunday. Uh, yeah. You come in on Monday, you, you, you slap them, take one run around a bit and watch the film. Take care of your body, have the next day off. Okay, and then Wednesday, uh, you're out there, uh, it's a work day. Uh, Thursday, you kind of taper off, Friday, you rest your body. Saturday, you're on the road or you're resting, okay, and you play on Sunday. So it's a very regimented routine. Uh, so you don't really get, you know, most of the guys today, um, you know, it's a little different than when we played because we had a $2 million payroll, you know, so yeah. a lot of the guys hung out together, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a little different now because you have guys, uh, you know, I'd say, eight or nine of you guys on your rosters that are making big, big money and you're veterans. They don't really have anything to do with the rookies. Yeah. So the rookies kind of have to find their way around it. Uh, they only get one day off. So they kind of hang out at their house a little bit rather than going out and putting it out there in public. Like, you never see J.J. J. J. Watt running around in Houston. No. You just never do during the season. Yeah. Why? He's a victim of his own fame. So there's a little bit of a difference between, you know, when, when Marino and those guys played back in the 70s and 80s Okay, yeah. and, and what these guys are doing now, because it's all about economics. Plus, you also have social media out there. Okay, and you also have, you know, these guys are in a little bit of a microscope. But to answer your question, uh, it's just a blast. Uh, you know, if you if, if never really touch the ground, because once you make a roster, you you're, uh, you you feel like you're a star. And what I mean by that, you, you, you can be competing about your against yourself all your life. You're living yeah. a dream that you, you started out as a child. And now you're living it, and your feet just never touch the ground. Okay, and I think that's the, you know the best way to explain it. Because I asked that very question to Gerard Williams when I was a rookie with the Washington Redskins. So Gerard, what's it like once you make a roster? Is Bill is like a star, your feet never touch the ground. And I thought that was the best way to explain it. Yeah, I could feel that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I get chills thinking about. Yeah, I can imagine that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go you one better, Damon. I'm a little bit of an anomaly in the sense that uh, I got to play in, in a in, a, in the USFL, which is a pioneer yeah. league, in the spring, and we went to a market called the Tampa Bay market, where the Buccaneers were absolutely horrible. Yeah, and yeah, we, yeah, you know, in one year we were actually better than them. And I can tell you right now, uh, the city uh, had the kind of buzz that it has right now for Brady. Yeah, oh, I mean, their people are lining up. Uh, you know, the, I mean, that, that, you know, season tickets. Uh, I mean, there's like, I think there's sold five or 6,000 of them. You know, it just, you know, it, just because of the injection there, their attendance is way down. But, you know, when you win down there in certain markets, it's really, really, it's really, really awesome. And it's just so much fun off the field. And I look back now, and I was just blessed to play the game. Uh, but, you know, as, as, the, as, as these guys, they kind of turn into the entertainment business where the, the, yeah. the mantra with the players is a little bit different, but they're still having fun. You just don't see it as much, you know, because they don't put it out there in public. Well, well you know, Bill, I got to tell you, since you're talking to a kid who was from the Michigan area, well, the Lions have been horrible for a long time. They had the Michigan Panthers, and they ended up winning a USFL championship. And let me tell you, they put 60,000 fans in the Silverdome for a uh, playoff game. So when you have a oh, yeah. team like that outperforming the NFL team, then there's no question about the buzz that definitely exists 
that becomes contagious in an area like that. So. Plus the, the cracker box they played in the Silver Dome. Yeah. That place would get noisy as heck in there. You know, and Abe and those boys came out. That's the best pro football team that ever came through uh, Detroit for a long period of time. The fans just ate those guys up. They, it was fun. You, uh, you know, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I feel you. I did, just imagine being a Detroit fan and going, going to see one of those games. It must have been a blast. Oh, so did you play yeah. in the Silver Dome, Bill? Yeah, how do you like playing at the Pontiac Silverdome? Oh, I, I liked it. It was, it was a cracker box. <laughs> it was out in the middle of nowhere. I, I was surprised that, you know, I mean, it wasn't a football field with a basically a bubble over it. Uh, you know, and it was, you know, but it was, it was cool. It was the Pontiac Silverdome. It was really cool. But after you see a lot of these yards, uh, you know, you just kind of sit back and go, I can see why they, you know, eventually, you know, they gave up on it because – you know, Detroit's a much bigger market and you need a bigger stadium. Well, actually, what happened there, Bill, and I and I was I was on the field many a times, is you had the artificial surface on cement. You had an 80,000-seat stadium in Pontiac, but you know what happened? The city of Pontiac screwed up so badly when William Clay Ford wanted to modify the lease, and when they didn't do it, he said, well, no problem, I'm going downtown. And, and, and they went to a 65,000-seat stadium versus an 80,000. But to get back to your analogy about Cracker Box, you, oh, you better believe it. I had been in that stadium numerous times, Thanksgiving, a lot of regular season games, where you put 80,000 people in that stadium, Bill, and you are not kidding. It gets really loud, and that bubble magnifies a lot. But think about it. I'm standing on the field, okay, with my shoes or uh, hiking boots on, with artificial surface and hard-nosed cement. I can only imagine how much your body took a pounding for being on such a surface, Bill. Yes, prehistoric. I played uh, in the first AstroTurf surface ever installed, Empire Stadium. Uh, you know, and uh, there's no give at all. Uh, it was like playing on asphalt. So you've kind of changed the way you play. You stay on your feet. You don't throw your body. You put a lot of pads around your knees and elbows uh, because you just can't bounce off that asphalt because there's no give. Right. I mean, there, there, there have been some boneyards that we played in, but the Pontiac Silverdome and the Panthers back then, they rocked. It was great. You know, it was a hard, tough place to go in and win. When I was with the Panthers, we went up there and played. We got our asses kicked. Did you really? Oh, so you, oh, yeah. you remember we, that, we huh? The Panthers, we beat the Panthers uh, when I think it was the third game, the second game of the season, uh, the first year of the league, and they had just signed Anthony Carter. So they were just, just getting their act together. Okay, and then they went out and got uh, Tyrone McGriff and Ray Penny, those three guys, those three offensive linemen. Right. So they started rolling. And then we happened to go up there three-quarter mark of the season. Okay, our quarterback got hurt, and they let out our best running back coming out of the backfield. And it was like the second play of the game. And, it was, you know, you can see it on my highlight film on my YouTube channel. I mean, they just laid out Gary Anderson. And we just sat there all day long. It was one of the worst experiences of our life. We just got a freaking ass kicked all day long. And that usually happens, you know, once a season. You know, no matter what happens, you know, it, you know, nothing goes right that day. And the Panthers got on a roll. They really got on a roll. They were a tough place to play, you know. But they weren't that great outside the Dome. But they were really tough inside the Dome because of the fans. Hey, Damon, you want, to, home field yeah. you want to know an interesting irony about what Bill's telling you about that second game over at uh, Tampa Stadium? I was covering it for a uh, – weekly newspaper in South Florida, and Bill was on the uh, team, and now it took us, what, into the new millennium to get to know each other, that we were in the same building, uh, didn't know each other. Bandits, right? uh, yeah. Unbelievable, huh, Big Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have, um, you know, it's, it's fun because social media has allowed uh, a fossil like me to be dug up and be resurrected, and the things that are really funny is that, Damon, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Because now we have spring football and, you know, the XFL, and uh, that's going to make its mark. However, it's not the same um, business model financially as the USFL was. But give that lead time, and people will sit there in the stands and watch it uh, because of the talent level that's out there and giving guys opportunities to play. Yeah, uh, and it's really funny right now. Those guys, even though the league's suspended, Vince is taking very good care of them. They're all still getting paid. They also have their medical benefits. They're, out, they're scheduled to come in next year. And a lot of those guys, all they need is reps. It's sort of like the NBA B League. Uh, you know, and it, so it's going to be fun to, to watch the dynamics change. But what's also driving a lot of this is fantasy. DraftKings was getting ready to have, the, the, you know, in week six of the 
XFL, they had a fantasy roster. Okay, and you also have legalized gambling where Vegas just absolutely love the XFL. So we had, instead of cable TV in the 80s, really what we had was a smartphone in streaming uh, driving the league, but it's simply the same business model as cable. And the more things change, the more they remain the same. All right. And this- so I'm kind of fun that I get to, you know, Scott and I can reminisce in the 80s and still be current today because we're going to watch the same business model all over again. Yeah, and, uh, and on a smaller scale, but more tech savvy. Yeah, and at some point when Bill and I meet and we go into a restaurant, Bill's probably going to be my bodyguard because I won't be able to keep my big mouth shut anyway, so I have to save me. You couldn't stuff. afford me, Scott. You couldn't afford me. Well, I me, couldn't. Uh, I'll be Candy's bodyguard for free, but yours? I'm going to charge you through the nose. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I'll just remember, the, you, you need he, me to be the lifeline of this uh, broadcast. And by the way, just so you know, this broadcast is being heard on the uh, South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network. And you want to go to our website, for which Damon does contribute, www.SouthFloridaTribune.com. Get you there, and you can see uh, Damon, who's our Tribune correspondent. Candy's shopping at the bit to say something. Otherwise, she's looking to laugh at me. Go ahead, Candy. What do you, what's your response to Bill Winters? Thanks for the love, Bill. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. So, all right, so, Bill, my question to you is this, Okay. With the XFL right now and that new collective bargaining agreement, would you say that that uh, league is going to be uh, hampered by it, or is there enough good players to support that league as well as the additional roster spots on an NFL roster? Oh, the, the latter for sure. Vince is not Vince is not concerned at all what's going on with the X, uh, with the NFL collective bargaining agreement. Uh, you know, he's taking care of his players and his franchises. All right, and they're just they're, they're chopping it a bit to get back in and finish their season. Uh, you know, I think that they're, they're, you know, I don't think that's going to happen this year. But they'll pick up right where they left off next year once we get through this as a country. Yeah, I like the way Bill can candidly say, I couldn't afford you. My goodness. Uh, oh, well, you know, I guess I don't have uh, John D. Rockefeller money, but boy, I got airtime. <laughs> have to, yeah. I have it's to not, negotiate it. It's not about the money, it's how you spend it. That's yeah, true. Exactly. Okay, uh, you know, I got it. That's, I'm just tell you that right now. Okay, it's not how much money you make; it's the lifestyle you have and how you spend it. Okay, I, I, I'm laughing because you know, sitting Tom Brady's made all this money, but I don't think he's had as good a lifestyle as I have. He's won Super Bowls and all that stuff, but I got to play pro football in Florida. I spent my off seasons down there. I kind of chose where I wanted to go. I knew I was smart enough to be a good player. I know I had first round measurables after my second year in the league. When a head coach comes up to me, who's a rookie coach, whose son is supposed to be a phenom with the LA, uh, the LA Rams, and turns uh, Sean McVay and comes up to me at a tryout camp after I'd been cannon fodder with the Washington Redskins the year before and learned how to go to camp. He turns around and he says to me, You're going to be my starting center. I'm going to build my entire offensive line around you. Well, I knew right then and then that, you know, the National Football League is like anything else, it's not where you come from. Okay, it's where you wind up. Okay, and I love the fact that Brady was a low-round draft choice, you know, but there are a lot of guys like me that were linemen that you don't get a lot of recognition, but we were able to pick where we wanted to go and sign one-year deals with no options and have a great lifestyle. So I got to play down in Tampa. It's taken time 20 years to get down there. <laughs> I had to go and win a couple of Super Bowls up in New England and then play in the snow and all this other stuff. And I'm just kind of jesting. But back then, we were just a bunch of guys that loved playing the game. We all got pretty much got paid the same, and it was more of a sport. Now it's entertainment. There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of lot of this, a lot of that. Uh, but it's still football when you get right down to it. I think that's going to be the beauty of uh, you know some of us is we're able to cut through what I consider the fluff and really get to you know like we talked about tonight. You know how the Lions are building their team, right? You know because it's really the same business model. You know, but there's a lot of dysfunction out there with entertainment. I'm kind of laughing right now at DeAndre Hopkins. You know, DeAndre and Bill O'Brien are pretty close. You got Michael Irvin running around, you know, talking about how O'Brien was, you know, said something to him in a meeting about Aaron Hernandez and all his baby mamas. And it was probably said in jest, but the, the, the media just ran with it. Oh, yeah. You know, and you kind of sit back and go, this is the, you know, this is where we're at right now. And, uh, you know, there'll be some sense and sensibility as that pendulum kind of moves back to the middle and we kind of get through this corona, you know, this corona crisis, number one. And then as, as, as kids get more educated from things like podcasts and shows that we do, 
they're going to see that things really haven't changed that much in 35 or 40 years in football. It's just a little bit more economically based, a little bit more hype because of the amount of money that's involved. Okay, but it's, you know, players still don't like, you know, I, I play, we went to London and played. You know, I have no disrespect to that. That was a long-ass road trip. You know what I mean? It's still a long-ass road trip. Okay, so, you know, we, we kind of were one of some of the first teams to do it. And you, you see how the NFL's capitalized on it. The owners are all about the money. And the players are all about lifestyle and, and, and uh, you know, and playing ball and loving what you do. Uh, and, you know, it's a little bit of a push pull back. But, you know, the younger generation come up is going to see through that. They're going to spread the wealth out a little bit more. And I think put a better product out there as well. Uh, well because the owners are adjusting a little bit. Yeah, you know, I just thought of this, you know, when you throw travel into these people's, to these teams' schedules, you know, hopefully their players have passports, you know, with the coronavirus being what it is right now and not coming into contact with anybody, it's going to be hard for them to adjust to that, you know, if that's a problem. Well, Damon, that's, you know, that's a good point that, you know, yeah. that you reminded me that I wanted to bring up in this meeting, uh, you know, talking on, on, on this on our podcast. Yeah. You know, all these trades, uh, they're not going to be finalized at all. Yeah. Until the player actually signs it and then it has a physical. Yeah. And right now the NFL is kind of sitting back and going, okay, this all looks good and everything, but none of these trades are going to be finalized until we get a physical. And, uh, and then the unions turn around and going, well, who's going to give us the physical? Because yeah. that's just another way to control the player. So it's going to be a third party, you know, a physician that's going to give the player a physical to find out, you know, how, you know, you know, how good this player is. Like, yeah. for example, that's the problem with Cam Newton right now. They don't know if he, how healthy he is, and he wants, you know, top dollar. Okay, so, you know, you, 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 you kind of sit back and you've got to make some uh, decisions on some factors that maybe 20 years ago weren't such a big factor. All right, you kind of knew the player was, you know, injured, but now we got a virus. Okay, so we got to find out if the player's got the virus before we give them, you know, a huge contract. So there's a little bit more caveats than there were on other layers of bureaucracy as there are, you know, in today's game versus when we played back you know, 35, 40 years ago. Yeah. So. Well, I guess, Bill, the one thing you've told me is I, I need a new financial advisor so I can afford you, right? Well, you know, to be honest with you, there's genius and simplicity. I look back now and I laugh at these contracts where they uh-huh. sit there and go, okay, I just signed for $80 million, guaranteed. And you sit back and go, well, if you really look at these contracts, the way they're structured, the guy has to make the team. And back then, we also knew if you asked for too much money, you're out, you're gone, because they'll take your job away from you, okay, because somebody's willing to play for less. And then, right. so there's a game within the game. So you got a lot of guys that are signing these huge contracts, like, you know, five-year contract with $110 million, $60 million guaranteed. Uh, well, you know, I always, we look at it and we go, well, half of that's going to taxes, okay, and half of that's going to your agent, okay, and then you have to make the team every year, and they don't pay that money up front. They're going to pay that, you know, $40 million guaranteed over five or six years, and a lot of times they're back on the fact that you're going to get injured you're not going to be able to fulfill your contract, so they give that money back. Andrew Luck wound up giving back a quite a bit of his contract when he decided to retire. So, you know, the, 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 you know, it's not what you think. This is not the NBA. Okay, this is, a, you know, these are 50, you know, 50 some odd 60 man rosters where guys are getting hurt. The NFL aren't going to give these guys all this money up front, have them injured and sit in the tub. You know, then you have the inmates running the asylum. You know, they're businessmen. You know, most of these guys are going to get there like Brady's getting all his money now. Right. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, he's getting $30 million. He's going to a team with no state tax. He's going to make up for all the years he was underpaid. Well, and, you know, I, I, I was laughing because, you know, some of these guys just say, screw it. Like Clowney, and what, they just want their money. Right. So a lot of it's where you come out of college. Like, if you're a number one pick, you have that kind of leverage. Nobody's going to pick up Clowney this year. We got three sacks and he was injured. Seattle wants him back, but he's not going to get it anywhere near what he wants. So what he'll do is he'll just sit back and wait for somebody to get hurt. Well, okay, because he knows he can do that production. Nope. So that's what they're doing. That's what, you know, Jameis Winston's going to do. Andy Dalton's going to do. Okay, I love to chase Daniels. Those guys are career backups, and they get paid a lot of money. They right. just sit there, but they've proven that they can come in and, and lead a team for four or five games. That's why they're making their money. But that's, a, that's an anomaly in a quarterback position. The rest of the stuff... You know, you, you got to be very lucky to be able to put yourself in a position where you have leverage yeah. on, a, on an organization like Clowney and everything. So those guys play that card, and they play it well. And that's exactly what Hopkins is doing. But for the rest of the league, no, no. 
Okay, don't lose sight of the fact, Bill, that Tom Brady signs with the Buccaneers and their season ticket sales are really going through the roof right now. So, you know, while they'll pay him a boatload of money, Tampa, from what I heard today, is has the worst record of all the four major sports teams. I think they have a winning percentage. Uh, I believe 367. Three. Yeah. yeah, three. Uh, in the 300s, I think 367, 387. So Tom Brady will pay his contract by what uh, he uh, puts in the stands as well. He'll he'll put rear ends in the seats for oh. sure. Oh, without a doubt. And you know what this reminds me of? What's that? Remember when Pete Rose signed with the Philadelphia Phillies? Yeah. Back in the day? Yeah. You probably weren't even born, Damon. Okay, uh, but the no. Phillies. <laughs> All right, I knew, yeah. but the, the bar, yeah, Pete Rose signed with the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. Okay, they had, I don't know, five, they probably had another seven or 8,000 season ticket holders because everybody wanted to see him play. He played for his contract in one day. Yeah, I believe All right. that. You know, and so, you know, this is a business. You know, Tom, uh, you know, his family wants to stay up east, warm weather climate, you know, uh, and, you know, he, he, he's got the great supporting cast. His original general manager signed him with New England. Okay, so he's gone full circle. So he's just like Steve Young said. He's just going to relax and have a good time. Have a good time. But this guy's a competitor. They got a legitimate shot. Okay, at being, uh, there's some people that have them rated as the second or third best team to go to the Super Bowl. Because yeah. they lost, they, 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 they were in eight or nine games last year and, only, and lost by seven points. Right. And Jameis Winston threw a lot of picks. So if they get that under control, they could, be, they could win 11 games and be sneaky good real quick. Okay, you're talking about people going to, uh, you know, you know, maybe say another seven or eight thousand season ticket holders. Okay, back when the Bucks were really, really good, and I had the pleasure of coming into a market where they were dog squeezed. Right. They looked like a best of best of virgins. We kind of showed them how to market it, and then the USFL folded, and then they they sold ownership, and they came in, they changed their uniforms, they built Raymond James Stadium, and then they they won the Super Bowl. Then they yeah. went right back to doing what they did before. So it's cyclical, all right? I mean, the, the, the Buccaneers are one of the worst attendance in the league. We have 52,000. Right. Okay, well, you know right now they're going to be sold out and they're going to have a, a waiting list of twenty to 40,000, 50,000 people, just like they did uh, 17 years ago when they won the Super Bowl. Absolutely. They a waiting list of 100,000 people. Absolutely. They a waiting list of 100,000 people. Yeah. I hope they get so, some you know, money night football. It's great. What's that? Yeah. Oh, I said I hope they get some Monday night football. Brady with the box, that's going to be awesome. Well, you know, and that's an interesting point by both of you. That's an interesting point by both of you because now all of a sudden, okay, Brady signs with Tampa and they haven't uh, made a decision before the schedules come out to decide who they're going to put on Monday Night Football as well. So both of you guys make very, very, very valid points. So I'm glad you both brought that up. we got another uh, five to seven minutes to go into broadcast. So, uh, Oh, Damon, why don't you go ahead and uh, have any other questions? Uh, Bill, you're on point about a lot of different things, even though you did a good job trying to uh, dodge that thing about me needing a financial advisor to afford your services. So I'm waiting to go ahead and agitate you about that because I know I'll get a, a six foot five uh, laugh out of you, knowing full well that he loves to needle me every opportunity he gets. And uh, thankfully, I haven't had to use a chill, Bill tonight because he's doing a really good job educating a young guy who's learning about him tonight. So uh, as long as I don't have to use chill bills, I won't have to worry about affording your services. Right, Bill? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Boy, I'm talking like a true coach. I love it, man. You guys are the best. So with that said, okay, you know, let's talk a little bit more about uh, an interesting trade that occurred. And I'm sure you might have a, uh, opinion on this. Bill and I talked about it last night, but Nick Foles does get traded to the Chicago Bears yeah. by the Jaguars. First of all, Damon, do you have an opinion on that? Yes, I did, and when we were talking, I immediately thought about that. Uh, Mitchell Trubisky, what does that mean? Like, what you know, are they trading him? Is, you know, because that's going to no. be another quarterback that's going to be out there. Like, They're doing the same thing the Lions are doing. They, uh, they, the, first of all, uh, Foles played for Nagy. Nag- yeah. Also, the other there's the, I think there's three coaches on the staff. And what's really funny, one of my old teammates is a line coach for the Bears now, Juan Castillo. All right, yeah. so that I'm really looking forward to maybe getting a chance to go down there and watch some practice up front. They're not happy with Trubisky, but they, he's the number one draft choice. But they had to bring in Foles because they know what they got with him, 
and I would say right now he's going to be the starter. Okay, and uh, they're going to they're going to push Trubisky because they, they they're taking the gloves off. He was a rookie, you know, and, and you, you know you might call him a guy, but Nagy wants to keep his job. Okay, and they know what they got defensively, and they know they got a real good football team, but they got to clean that quarterback position up, and so they were willing to trade for Foles. And what's really interesting is they just restructured his contract. And so he's going to get $20 million a year, so he's happy. Just he's the same money he got in Jacksonville. And the only difference is, is if he winds up being the starter and produces, he's a free agent at the end of the year. All right, so Trubisky is going to sit back and go, uh, you know, I need, to, I need to produce. And what's really great about Foles is he's been in that environment before with Carson Wentz. Yeah, so he knows how to play the game within the game. So that would be a really good quarterback room. And that'll be a really good team because a team generally likes Trubisky. He's too inconsistent. He's not accurate. So if you yeah. bring in Foles, Foles can kind of mentor him a little bit and, and eventually hand the ball off. And I'm going to close with this. It's a long season. You need two quarterbacks. Oh, you're yeah. going to win a Super Bowl. You know, very rarely will a guy be able to go through the entire season without, you know, getting dinged up. So, you know, that only strengthens their team in building depth. Okay, yeah, they're a little expensive at the quarterback position because basically they got two guys they're paying a ton of money to. Something Detroit might look at doing with Timo, but I doubt it very much because of the guys that are running that team. But uh, yeah, uh, but you know, you, that, that's that's all that's going on over there with the Bears. Okay, I want that, that's, you know, the, I want to add a couple of points, Bill. Uh, you really uh, struck a pretty good chord here. Uh, I want to go back to Brady for just a moment. Go, go, he goes to Bruce Arians, and everybody knows that Bruce Arians worked with Carson Palmer, Ben Roethlisberger, and Peyton Manning. So that's why I think the comfort level outside of Jason Lick uh, was there in addition to Bruce uh, Arians' credibility. Uh, that's item number one. Item number two, okay, Bill, now that the Jaguars let uh, Foles go to the Midwest, who do you think would be an ideal backup for Gardner Minshew in uh, Jacksonville? It's too early to tell. Uh, you know, you've got guys that are sitting out there right now like Andy Dalton, Jameis Winston. Uh, you know, these guys are not getting their money. So I'm thinking that after the draft, then they'll kind of fill those roster spots up right now. Okay, uh, you know, you, you could see uh, two of them in Jacksonville. Uh, you know, or something like that, something wild. Uh, you know, you got a quarterback that, you know, Minshew that can play. I'm not sold on the ability for him to lead a team to a Super Bowl. I think he's a little too fragile. Uh, but, you know, let's give the guy the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but the reality is, is that um, that's probably what's going on in that particular situation is they're just going to wait till after the draft to see, you know, where they fill in these uh, quarterback spots. You know, I, I, it was kind of funny. We were talking about Jameis Winston maybe going to the Steelers. Uh, you know, I, I would have laughed at that last week, but after I see how they filled the spot, that might be the only place for him to go. Really? And he doesn't have to worry about, you know, winning. But, yeah, uh, because of the fact that Roethlisberger is coming back, and then they got that other guy that, you know, is pretty good. And, you know, Jameis needs to work on uh, coming in and decompressing, try not to do too much. Uh, and uh, he's, he's a good quarterback, but, you know, he can get mentored by Ben Roethlisberger and maybe run up and throw so many picks and be like a Charlie Patch, as I like to say. Well, yeah, I, so, I love Charlie. You know, but he's not going to get the money he's going to get. He's not well, going to get the money he wants. And, and don't lose sight of the X factor that Mike Tomlin's a heck of a coach, so I think he might be a settling influence as well. All right, with that said, okay, yeah. uh, Damon, why don't you let everybody know how they can get a hold of you. Bill, you're going to do the same, and then we're going to wrap it up. So, Damon, how can – uh, let everybody identify you uh, on social media and let everybody know once again what you do for the uh, Tribune. Go ahead. Yes, so you can contact me on the South Florida, or not contact, but find my content on the South Florida Tribune. Just type in Damon in the search bar and you'll find all my latest stories, latest and greatest. Also, Facebook, just Damon Knight. You'll find my find my picture. And then uh, my Twitter handle is at Damon with a capital D, capital K N one nine nine three zero four zero nine. I should pre- I should preface yeah. the fact that now Damon Knight is a member of Detroit Sports Media, an yes. organization yeah. for which I belong to as well, as well as yeah. George Icorn and the rest of my colleagues back up in Detroit. Phil, yeah. your turn. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel. The easiest way to do that is go to the YouTube search engine, type in Bill Winters and put the word football afterwards. And you'll see a purple circle that will come up with me wearing a Nike hat and click subscribe and you're in. 
uh, the NFLPA helped me build a nice Wikipedia page. Uh, you can go to Bill Winters Football to see my body of work. Uh, and then I also, on Facebook, go to facebook.com forward slash bwinters55, and you'll sort through all the Bill Winters out there, and you'll see my uh, Facebook page. And then, of course, you can find us on, uh, on iHeart, Apple, and uh, Spotify by typing in Motormouth, which is two words, and Wild Bill Winters, that's our show. And it'll come right up, and we'd love for you to subscribe and grow with us. Absolutely. And finally, myself, I'm the founder and CEO of the South Florida Tribune and the South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, uh, my personal page is Scoop, as Damon knows it all too well, right? Scoop. Uh, that's how. Yeah, scoop, uh, yeah. That's how Aaliyah Nicholas. Uh, by the way, I should tell you this, Bill. Uh, Damon works at uh, my f- former employer, a restaurant back in the metropolitan Detroit area, out in Highland, Michigan. That's how I came in contact with him. But Scoop, and then you have five threes. So count to five threes, and then you got the personal. You can also reach me on Twitter at, at Tribune South. And also, I have a, uh, we have a YouTube channel, South Florida Tribune. You can follow us there as well as on Instagram. And on, and on Facebook, we have our own Facebook page. So meanwhile, guys, I'm really proud of the work you put, both put in tonight. It's been a pleasure having you both on for the entire duration. Bill, you know, hopefully we'll do it again down the road. But you guys were both fantastic collectively. So on behalf of uh, Damon Knight, my name is Scott Morgan Roth, the Motor City Mad Mouth. That ought to ring nice bells to you, right, Damon? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Scooper. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Bill. It's a pleasure meeting you. And, yeah. I mean, so on behalf of all three of us, uh, we want to wish you a great night and look forward to uh, another broadcast with Wild Bill and I uh, next week. So good evening, everybody. And uh, you can, again, you'll also be able to find Bill Winters on the Sports Exchange. He's a regular contributor. So once again, guys, it's, it's great to have you on the program together. I think you both did a really nice job. Uh, Bill giving uh, Damon a little education about uh, football past and present. So, once again, everybody, good night, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yep. Good night, guys. Nice talking to you, Damon. Yeah, yeah.